As you're seated, if you would take your copy of God's Word with me and turn to Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians you find right after Philippians, and we're going to look at chapter 1 together in Paul's prayer in verses 3 to 12. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. And there it is written, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it, and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our great and holy Father, we remember the many peaceful hours we have enjoyed in communion with you, many of them together with our brothers and sisters in worship, and many alone seeking you in prayer. And Father, this evening we pray that you would help us again recover and revive and seek time and seek focus and seek that the meditation of our heart would be you and your Son. We pray that you would be the consuming focus of our attention and our heart, and we pray that you would breathe further zeal and earnestness into our lives in prayer. We come weak, we come needy, we come distracted. Father, we pray you would help us, and that you would, in this world of distraction and harriedness and anxiety. Give a calm and serene frame and mind to your people upon your word and upon your son. And we ask these things in his holy name. Amen. Well, before there was television, before there was social media, in the 17th century, philosopher Pascal observed how people crave and seek mental distractions. In his Pensees, Pascal made several observations about diversion and distraction. Things like, take away diversion, and we feel soon our nothingness. It is indeed to be unhappy as soon as we are reduced to think of self and have no diversion. Or he also observed, I've discovered that all the unhappiness of men arises from one single fact. They cannot sit quietly in their own rooms. We cannot sit quietly alone. We need diversions. We need to be diverted from thinking of ourselves, thinking about how hopeless life is all alone in ourselves, how hopeless we are if we have not God. And really all that modern media has done since the 17th century has just accelerate and improve our ability to distract ourselves and to divert ourselves from thinking about who we are and who God is. Seeking distraction is logical if you're in the world and you have no hope and you have not God. But it's antithetical to Christians. We have hope. We know meaning. So to soak our minds in a thousand frivolities or banal distractions goes against our very character, who we are. God gave us minds to think about Him, to focus on Him, to meditate on what He says in His Word, 
and to increase our joy and our hope by being alone in our rooms with him. And guarding that mind, the Christian mind, is Paul's main concern in this book, Colossians. Colossae was threatened by some kind of Jewish mysticism. And if you turn with me to chapter 2 and just glance at a couple of verses, we kind of get an idea of what Paul is driving after. In verse 4, he talks about plausible arguments. In verse 8, he warns about philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. And then in verse 18, he talks about those who go on in detail about visions and puffed up without reason by their sensuous mind. So much in the book of Colossians, Paul is dealing with the mind. He's dealing with thoughts, with knowledge. He's dealing with how Christians think and meditate and what they think on. And he's already said in chapter 2, if you look back at verses 1 to 3, he struggled in prayer. He says in verse 1, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. He's talking about his prayer life. I've prayed for you, Colossians, that you would know, verse 2, the riches of understanding and knowledge which is Christ, in verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's prayed for them, for their minds to be focused on Christ. He'll go on in chapter 3, verse 2, and say explicitly, set your minds on Christ. Set your minds on things above where Christ is. And then if you notice verse 10 of chapter 3, Paul describes the new self that every Christian has, the new man in Jesus, It's being renewed in knowledge, being renewed in knowing him. It's not just in Colossians here. We could move throughout the New Testament. To the Romans, Paul wrote, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your your minds. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, gird up the loins of your mind. Set your hope fully on the grace that is to be revealed in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly, In the Bible, we are told that how we think and what we think about is intimately related to who we are. It directs and defines us. What we think directs who we become. Where we set our minds is the compass by which our life will be determined. An older writer, J.B. Lightfoot, once quipped that we must not only seek heaven, we must think heaven. And that is how heaven is sought. It is thought about. It is meditated upon. And though we don't face probably many issues related to Jewish mysticism like the Colossians did, but the point of Paul in Colossians is no less necessary. The content of our minds has eternal consequences. The focus and meditation of our minds is massive for the Christian. So how do we fight distraction? How do we fight diversion? How do we fight just the plain plain fragmentation of our minds and busyness? How do we reclaim our minds for God? That's where Paul starts in chapter 1. He starts in prayer. We begin by seeking God in prayer. That's where everything begins. Seeking Him in prayer. And in verse 3 to 12 that we've just read, Paul shares his prayer life. He shares with the Colossians what he's praying for them. And that's not just to let us know what Paul's prayed. It's intentional. Paul is setting out a pattern. He's showing a way to think, a way to pray. He's summarizing even the entire book in his prayer and laying it out as a pattern for the Colossians and pattern for us. And Paul's prayer, if you look at chapter 1, verse 3, basically falls into two parts. From verses 3 to 8, he thanks God for what he's done what God has done in Christ. And then in verses 9 to 12, he asks God for what the Colossians must do. What God has done, what the Christians must do. All wrapped up in prayer. And here, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about how we seek a Godward mind in prayer. We seek a Godward mind through prayer to have our minds focused and fixed on Christ, meditating on His Word, marinating in his truth and undistracted. What I want us to do is just walk through this prayer and make three observations. We'll look at prayer as a discipline, prayer as a delight, and prayer as a disciple. Discipline, delight as a disciple. 
Let's look first as we think about prayer as a discipline. Notice in verse 3, Paul speaks about prayer as a discipline in two different ways. First, notice he says at the end of verse 3, when we pray. When we pray. Prayer is a disciplined, assumed, scheduled part of Paul's life and ministry. It's part of what he does. It's not haphazard when the mood only strikes him. It's regular, repeated, and set. It's likely that Paul followed the Jewish tradition of prayer in morning, noon, and evening in that form and discipline. Such forms came into the early church and were much a part of early Christian spirituality. And those forms and those disciplines, beloved, shouldn't be discarded. It's often mistaken that much of the Reformers protest about Roman Catholic monasteries in the Reformation wasn't about the form and discipline and the liturgy of what they did. It was the fact that they sequestered it in the monasteries. And the Reformers said, no, Christians, the super great Christians are not the ones that hide up on a hill behind walls and seek God. It's what we all do. It's what we're all called to do as God's children in his church. And we need to be reminded that our generation's resistance to forms, to discipline, to schedule, that's not spirituality. That's not gospel-centered. It ignores the fact that my heart does not naturally and spontaneously bend to spiritual things. I have sin remains that fights against that. I have to discipline myself to do it. We discipline ourselves to eat because we know that if we don't, we'll grow weak. We discipline ourselves to rest because if we don't rest, we'll fail. We discipline ourselves in our relationships to spend quality time with our spouses or our friends because we know if we don't, our relationships will fray. Is it any different with God? It's not different at all. We need to schedule when we eat His Word. We need to schedule when we rest in Him. We need to schedule quality alone time with God. To be clear, it's not pray because you have to. It's pray because we get to, because the new and living way has been opened up by our great high priest, and we can have regular recourse to our God. He hears us, he knows us, he sees us, and he answers our prayers as he opens up himself to us through Christ. So Paul's discipline to prayer the second discipline that we see in verse 3 is his discipline to give thanks. Notice when we pray, we always thank God. Thanksgiving is a discipline. It is a decision of faith. Because what's the natural tilt of ourselves? The natural tilt of our sin is to take things for granted. Or to be ungrateful when we don't get what we assume we should have and deserve. That's how the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 1 describes sin and its most basic element that even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. Ingratitude is a basic marker and characteristic of sin because everything we have comes from Him. And so when the Christian, when we give thanks, it's an act of repentance and an act of faith. Gratitude to God is a fundamental break from sin. It's a fundamental turning away from the inward selfishness and self-absorption that is ours by nature in sin. And it's breaking with it and turning from it and confesses by faith, I only receive. I only receive. Even though I feel like I deserve, I feel like I have earned, I feel like I have created, I only receive. I'm sustained by the word of a God. And I only receive only. And that's why the Christian life throughout the Bible is characterized as a life of gratitude, of thanksgiving. As you move through the book of Colossians, maybe you do that tomorrow or later this evening. It's a short book. You'll notice how often Paul brings up thanksgiving. The book even ends with the final exhortation of chapter 4, verse 2, continue steadfast in prayer with thanksgiving. Always thanksgiving. It's characteristic of the godly life to be grateful, to be humble before God and grateful and resisting grumbling. Paul says, we always thank God. Always. Think about that. We always thank God about you. He's not writing this letter to just tell them he's grateful for them. 
they have problems. They have big problems. They have problems that we've already looked at with Jewish mysticism. There's legalism is taking over in Colossae. He, he says in chapter 2, verse 20, why do you submit to these decrees? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. You have legalism talking, taking over. This church has issues. And Paul says, we always thank God for you. I've gotten a bit more sensitive recently to growing criticism over evangelicalism in America. Mostly because it doesn't really exist. Let me help you with the next headline that will come out whenever it does about evangelicals believe blank or do blank or are blank. Evangelical is a historic word that arose during the Reformation. It just means gospel people. It was a distinction that they used instead of Protestant. It's better than Protestant because it's positive and not negative. But it was a historic word. But in the last about 150 years ago, it's become largely a term of demographics. It's a term used by sociologists and political analysts to, to bunch people together. People that may have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Evangelicalism has no membership, has no defined set of beliefs, none. There is no central organization where you can find out who's in charge and who belongs and who doesn't. And I'll suggest if you can't define it, then maybe it doesn't exist. And even the polls that come out, they're self-selecting. You call somebody and ask, are you an evangelical? If they say yes, they are. But there's no standard to check them against. So how do we know who's in and who's out? And if they say yes, then what does that mean? So every time you hear evangelicals believe or do blank, ignore it. It's an absolutely meaningless statement. And my concern is not just to help you with the news. My concern is because it stokes cynicism, anger, and frustration. It creates perceptions in our minds that are bent to the negative and ignore the real work of God in his world and in his church. Now, of course, is much of visible Christianity in this nation weak and even false? Yes, absolutely. And beloved, it's been that way for 2,000 years. Go back and read Revelation 2 to 3. Look at Colossae. It's always been that way, and yet Paul says we always thank God. The discipline of gratitude fights the drift to grumbling. It fights the drift of ignoring that despite all of the problems, God is at work. He hasn't checked out. He is active in his people. And thanksgiving disciplines our minds to look at the fruit of God's work and look at what he's done, to look at our, our church, to look at our lives, to look at the lives of others we know. When we do that, is there weakness and growth and problems? Yes, plenty. But is there fruit of God at work? Yes, a lot. There are some of you here, won't point you out, but a year ago this time, you weren't walking with Christ at all. And now you are. There are some of us here who are actually struggling against the sin that we were totally ignoring a year ago. Is it still a struggle and a problem? Yes. But you're aware of it. God is at work. God is at work. And when we discipline ourselves to give thanks we return the reality of God at work to our lives and our minds. And we fight against that bent of grumbling and negativity and missing that he is living and active in grace among his people. God's work is apparent when we're disciplined in prayer and disciplined in thanksgiving. He returns to our minds. Prayer is a discipline. Secondly, I want us to look at prayer as a delight in verses 4 to 5 prayer as a delight. Paul's prayer begins with gratitude for what God has done in the Colossians. And notice very carefully as Paul says he thanks them for their, or he thanks God for their faith, their love, and verse 5, their hope. He does not congratulate the Colossians for any of these. He thanks God for what God has done. God has birthed their faith. God has created their love, and God has opened their eyes to see the hope that comes through the gospel alone. Many common questions we have about prayer 
really boil down to misunderstanding what prayer even is. Questions like, what do we do about unanswered prayer? Or, if God is sovereign, why do we pray? What these questions misunderstand, among many things, is that prayer is not basically a shopping list that we bring to God to change what we don't like. Prayer is communion with the triune God. And it's enjoying Him and delighting in Him. It's answering the one who has spoken to us in Christ and in His Word and returning back to Him and enjoying Him, adoring Him and delighting in God and what He's done. Just as Paul, where he begins here, just delighting in what God has done in the Gospel in the Colossians. Generally, we can be pretty poor at just spending time adoring and worshiping God in prayer. And I think that is a a large contributor to our disinterest in prayer generally. Because shopping lists are boring, and they seem hopeless. But enjoying and reflecting and meditating on what God has done and is doing in Christ, well, that inflames your heart, and you can do that for a long while. And what God has given us to enjoy is Himself to delight in. And here we have Paul's delight in God, that God has made the Colossians real Christians. That's what he's getting at here with their faith in verse 4, their love and their hope. This triad is known in Christianity as the three Christian virtues, the divine sisters it's been called. And they're a convenient summary of real Christianity, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love, that's the three-legged stool that we sit on as Christians. That's the basic virtues and characteristics of Christianity. And really a lot of confusion in our day about faith and what is real faith and how do faith and works go together. A lot of those questions arise from ignoring that this triad is always present in true Christians. Faith, hope, and love. When we return to the Bible, we see all of them working together. Augustine in the early church wrote a whole book on them, the Enchiridion, and he makes this observation. Demons neither hope nor love. The faith that works by love can't exist without hope. So, it is that love is not without hope, hope is not without love, and neither hope nor love are without faith. What Augustine's getting at is is faith without love and hope is only idea. It's just another philosophy, and, and he was right. The demons have that. And love without faith and hope, well, that's just empty sentimentality. And it's ultimately self-centered because it has no direction from Christ and it has no object of hope for all who belong to him. Or hope without love and faith, well, well, that's just presumption. It's false assurance. Hope without love and faith is the assumption that just everybody goes to a better place. and There's no need to, to trust and believe in Christ or have that faith work in love as the fruit of his spirit. False Christianity reduces Christianity to one or two of these things. But all three are present in real Christian life. That's what God creates when he creates new people. Faith and hope and love. And here we have in his prayer, Paul explaining how they work together. Look at verse 5. He's heard of your faith and of the love you have because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Literally, the hope that is stored away and secured for you, safely kept in heaven. What holds faith and love together? Well, it's hope. We trust Christ because our hope is to be with Him forever. Our our love for other Christians is because of our hope that they will likewise be remade in Him as we will. And we will be with them together, not floating around on clouds with harps, but in a city, the city God is making for His people to dwell with him forever. And in that day, faith and hope, they're going to vanish. And love will remain forever in that city. Heaven is a world of love. And until then, we need hope as the driver of faith and love to keep us trusting, keep us loving. In 1646, Puritan Richard Baxter got so ill, his doctor said he was terminal. Thinking that he was near to death, Baxter began to do what you do, think about death. He wrote later, I began to contemplate more seriously the everlasting rest, which I thought I was just on the border of. Now, Baxter's doctors were a bit off because he ended up living another 50 years. 
But his meditations on heaven continued. He didn't lose that discipline. They were so helpful that Baxter made it a discipline in his life to take a 30-minute walk before dinner every night, and he just thought about heaven for 30 minutes a day. Eventually, he wrote those meditations down. His great work that comes down to us today is The Saint's Everlasting Rest. He wrote that book to help Christians fix their eyes on hope. It is impossible to live as a Christian any other way than to not have their eyes fixed on that future hope that is laid up in heaven where love will exist forever. And Paul's prayer here of delight is given to show us not just what he thought of the Colossians, but how we think of ourselves. To look at what God has done. To look at what we have in Christ. Typically our fears and our desperation, our anxieties, our sin, they grow and discourage us because we've fixed on ourselves. We're fixed on our lives. Our minds are not focused on what God has done, what God promises to do. It's analogous to Peter walking on the water in the Sea of Galilee, and and when the waves take over and he loses sight of Christ, it's then he begins to sink. And that focus is offered to us in prayer, delighting in God, graciously thanking Him. I have faith. I have love. I have real hope. Meditating and enjoying what God has done in Christ and the fruit of the gospel. Prayer is a delight in God. Thirdly, in verses 9 to 12, I want us to think about prayer as a disciple. Prayer as a growing disciple. We have, Paul hasn't asked for anything yet in his prayer, and we don't get that into verse 9, when he says that we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you would be filled And when we get to Paul's prayer and his requests, it's really stunning to look at his emphasis and focus, and it's a tremendous lesson for us. These first Christians faced serious persecution. They faced deadly diseases. They were oppressed by the Roman Empire. Paul doesn't pray for a better Caesar or more medicine. The petitions that are usually at the top of our prayer list, they rarely even come up in the New Testament. Paul's foremost concern here, beginning in verse 9, is not that God would change the Colossians' circumstances, but that he would change their character, that he would change them, and that in all their circumstances, their faith and their love and their hope would grow and would blossom, and they would grow as disciples. And how Paul prays that God would change is a primer for us here in these verses on the Christian life. He prays, notice in verse 9, that they would know God's will, that you would be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What does that mean? That means that you would know what's spiritual, what's important, and how to apply it. In other words, you could just say, Paul is praying that you have spiritual discernment, that you know the truth of God, and you're able to make distinctions and apply that truth accurately. It's a pretty important prayer for a church that's being overtaken by mysticism and legalism. They'd be filled with the knowledge of God's word. They'd have spiritual discernment in their lives. But notice, as he moves, the sentence continues into verse 10. It's not merely intellectual. That you would have spiritual discernment. So, in order that, you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. That their daily lives before God would honor him because of what they know and what they've grown in. What does it look like when your daily life is pleasing to the Lord? Well, that's what Paul gives in verse 10 to 12. He gives four clauses that describe a God-honoring daily life. Look at verse 10. The first you have are deeds of faith, good works bearing fruit, bearing fruit in every good work. That's a term for gospel work. Notice in verse 6, Paul talks about the gospel has gone into the whole world bearing fruit and growing. You remember Jesus told his disciples that his commission to them was to go out and to bear fruits, and that was referred to their making disciples, abiding in his word, and speaking his word to others. Bearing fruit in good, every good work is, is doing gospel work, is being lights in their, in their lives, deeds of faith, explicitly, distinctly Christian lives of obedience, wherever they are. Secondly, the end of verse 10, Paul describes devotion to God increasing in the knowledge of God. As they live lives of obedience, 
what will happen? They'll encounter more trials, more suffering, more obstacles. And they'll be blessed more as they trust God in them. And they'll grow to know Him more and more and more, increasing in the knowledge of God as they walk, bearing fruit in every good work. Their devotion to God would increase. Thirdly, verse 11, it would be diligence and hope. Notice they'd be strengthened for all endurance. Characteristic of the Christian, to be strengthened with God's power for all endurance and patience. Patiently awaiting the realization of our hope. Patiently trusting God until what's stored away in heaven is our possession forever. Patiently enduring and being patient and trusting Him. Trusting that deliverance is always coming. And when you're a Christian, even death is a deliverance. And as Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, that upon his death, he would be delivered safely into the kingdom of God. Even death is a deliverance. So being diligent in his hope. And then fourthly, in verse 12, they would have doxology in life. Got carried away with the D's today. Doxology means praise. And it's important, the end of verse 11, with joy and giving thanks go together. So I'd like to move that comma at the end of verse 11 to the left, about two words. With joy giving thanks, praising God in gratitude, describing all the situations we're in, rejoicing in praise and thanks, because why? Whatever is going on in our lives, we have been qualified to share in the inheritance in Christ. It's ours, it's done, it's locked away in heaven, and it's ours. No matter how bad it gets, our inheritance is secure in Christ. So there's always motivation for praise and joy and gratitude. Even in the worst circumstances, our lives are headed for glory. Notice Paul's prayer here is that the Christian's mind would know God's truth and that their hearts and their hands would then follow. That their minds in verse 9 would be filled with the knowledge of His will so that they would walk and live daily pleasing to Him and glorifying Him. Based on Paul's requests here, I want to make three critical observations for us to think about. There's many more that we could have, but there's at least three things we need to check against our lives from these verses. The first is, to know God's will is to have doctrinal discernment. Knowing God's will is having doctrinal discernment. For us, when we think about prayer and the knowledge of God's will, what are we typically thinking of? We're usually thinking of decision-making. We're thinking of guidance. But here in the New Testament, prayer and God's will is about doctrinal knowledge, about knowing Him and knowing His truth and going deeper in Him. God has never promised to give us a roadmap in our lives to His secret will. He's never promised to give us that fully assured sense about which job you should take, which house you should buy, which, which person you should marry. Of course, we should pray for wisdom and all these things and many more, but emphasizing it misses the bigger picture. We need to pray to know His will. This is God's will. God has revealed to us what He wants and who He is and who we are before Him. To pray to know His will and to grow in knowing Him is to grow knowing His truth in His Word. To be able more and more to discern truth from error and to make those distinctions. To be teachable in sound doctrine. To be able to shed errors that we all have and that we're growing to get rid of and to humbly change our minds as God's Word corrects us and changes us and brings us more and more to His truth. Now thinking about life's decisions, do you know what happens when we pray this way and God answers this prayer? All those life decisions they get a whole lot easier. We get a whole lot better at them. But we pray for what God promised to give us insight into His Word, to grow in knowing Him, to grow in knowing His truth, and to be discerning people in our minds because of what we know. The second thing that we ought to quickly add to that is that to live a godly life begins with a godly mind. The order from verse 9 to verse 10 is so important, and it's so important that we don't neglect either one. We can't run off in verse 10 in a manner worthy of the Lord if we have no knowledge of His will and what it is to please Him. 
Nor should we stop in verse 9 and assume that growing in knowledge and being spiritual discerning, well, that's the end and sum of the Christian life. No, it's both together. Verse 9 and 10 stay together. Be filled with the knowledge of His will so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Be filled with His truth so that your lives are pleasing to Him and you live that way. I think my favorite opening line in any book is Charles Hodges' Way of Life. Wrote it in the 19th century. This is how he begins. It is one of the clearest principles of revelation that holiness is the fruit of truth. And it is one of the plainest inferences that the exposition of the truth is the best means of promoting holiness. Holiness is the fruit of truth. And they go together. Truth is for holiness. Holiness comes from truth. Truth by itself is not the Christian's goal. It's holiness. Holiness built on God's truth. We want to go deep into doctrine. We want to go deep into God's word. We want to know what his, what his word says and how his truth has been confessed over 2,000 years. We want to reject any idea that Christianity is just a life and not a doctrine. Baloney. It's doctrines that create a life, that build a life. But we also want to fear thinking that growing in knowledge and doctrine is by itself the end and the sum of the Christian life, because that is equally false. Growing to know God's word and to knowing his truth is not like carving a statue out of wood and polishing it and putting it on yourself and just admiring it. Hey, I, I understand this. Aren't you impressed? No, the truth of God's word is like a two by four. It's lumber. We, we get doctrines and we learn them and grow in them to build a house to live in, to build a life, and that God is glorified in the lives we live in accordance to his word. We have a great example even here in chapter 1 with Paul's hymn to Christ in verses 15 to 20 after his prayer. Paul in this hymn reflects on Christ's eternal person. He reflects on his, his eternal Godhead. He reflects on him condescending as a man and his work on the cross. But why? Look at verse 13. Because you've been delivered from the domain of, dar domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. You need to know your king and who you serve. And on the other side, in verse 23, Paul's quick application is, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Why do you need to know all these truths of Christology and soteriology and all these big words, the two natures of Christ and his full godhood and manhood and his perfect work on the cross? Why do we know, need to know these things? So that when life is hard, we don't give up the gospel. So that we persevere. So we live Christian lives when work stinks and family is hard and the children won't just be quiet. It's for life. We know it for life. Doctrine matters. We spend time meditating and seeking to know the truth of God. But it matters for our lives. It matters to shape the way we live, the decisions we make. If you're here now this evening and your life, as you know, is not worthy of the Lord, it's not fully pleasing to Him, let me ask you, where is your mind at? What is filling your thoughts and attention? What are you seeking where does your mind go when you don't have to think about something immediate at work or at school? Where are your thoughts drift? The wise Puritans will tell you where your thoughts drift when you don't have to think of anything that tells you where your heart is. What do you think about? We want to set our minds upon God and His truth that our hearts and hands would follow and that we'd live godly lives before Him seeking to build that house out of the lumber of His Word that He would be glorified in it. The third observation we want to make from Paul's request is that pray for God to give us what he commands. Pray that God would give us what he commands. Augustine, again, is famous for his prayer, command what you will and will what you command. And that's totally biblical. As you look at Paul's prayer here again in verses 9 to 12, what's striking is is that Paul prays for the very things he will command the Colossians to do in the rest of the letter. You have here even a summary of the outline of the rest of the letter. 
Paul is praying for the very things he tells them they must do. Paul is praying that God will create in his people the very things that God expects of his people. It is here just the very thing we find in Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you. Command what you will, will what you command. Give us what you command. In Reformed theology, we make a distinction between power and act. And what we're trying to do is preserve the reality that it is of God's fruit that we do anything, and yet it is our responsibility to do things. The power comes from God, all of it, yet the act is really ours. Without God's power, we're dead wood, cut off from the vine of Christ. But by the power of God, we are joined to Jesus, we're living branches, we're supple and able to grow, so we work. We grow, we strive, we discipline ourselves, and we pray for God to bear fruit. The responsibility and the discipline is ours. The power and the effect is all God's. And what this means at its most basic practice is that the first work of all our work is prayer. Prayer is the first work of every work. Without prayer, all our other work is in vain. Because if God has not given power in our efforts, it's going to be pointless. So as we pray, we don't just pray God's promises. We also pray his commands. And we ask him for the power and grace to walk in them. We pray and then we walk. We pursue him, trusting him and praying for him to supply all our needs as we seek to obey him. No one has more influence on us than us. You are the most influential person you will ever hear from us because no one talks to you more than you. You listen to yourself constantly. That means what we think on, what our minds cogitate on and discuss to ourselves is of utmost importance for our lives. The direction and focus of our minds will determine our lives. Our meditation, our attention, our prayerful devotion to God. It all begins in our minds. So pray for a Godward mind. Follow Paul's example and pattern that's laid out for us by the Holy Spirit here. To be praying, disciplined, delighting, to grow as a disciple. That God would give power to our efforts and focus our minds on Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the prophet of your word. We thank you for the usefulness of your word. We praise you for addressing us in ways that those separated by centuries apply and guide and direct our lives today. The Apostle Paul and the Colossians never had to deal with iPhones. But Father, how much your word through Paul is needed for us, that our minds would be fixed on you in prayer, and that you would so work in our lives accordingly. And Father, we do thank you for all that you have done, even as represented in our congregation at IBC. We thank you for the fruit of faith and love and hope that are so apparent in so many ways. And Father, we do ask that you would fill us more with the knowledge of your will and spiritual wisdom and understanding. Father, we need to be more discerning and less foolish. And we need so that we would walk worthy of you and glorify your name in our lives. Father, we pray you would help us to seek you and fix our thoughts and minds on you that you would be glorified as we live and move. And even as we enter, Father, this busy season of life here in our nation with the holidays and family and friends and all the responsibilities that seem to mount, may our minds and hearts be calm and serene seeking you, remembering that our greatest responsibility is that you would be glorified in our lives. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.